Hello. Sender uh, Dirksen. All right, put Sender Dirksen on. I, I'm ready. Right. I'm in a meeting. Tell him I'm in a meeting, yes. but I, I want to talk. I missed him when I was Security Council. All right. Thank you. All right. Senator Dirksen, yeah. the president. Hello. Yeah. Are you in a meeting? Yes, but go ahead. I can. I can. I well, can hear. Can you also say what is the situation? Uh, Everett, we uh, have said to. Uh, first of all, now I cannot tell you this if it's going to be quoted, because uh, I can't tell uh, the candidates and I can't tell anybody else. I haven't talked to a human. I want to comply with it and trust, but I sure do want it told to a human. I'll give you my solemn word. All right. The situation is this. Since September of last year, we have told Hanoi that we would stop the bombing. We're anxious to stop it. When they would engage in, these are the key words, prompt, productive discussions, that they would not take advantage of. Yeah. That is September. March 31st, I came to the conclusion that no living man could run for office and be a candidate and have them all shooting at him and keep this war out of politics and get peace. So I concluded yeah. that I should not run because I just prolonged the war by doing it. So I said then, we're stopping the bombing in 90%. We will stop it in the rest. If there can be any indication, that it will not cost us additional lives. <coughs> we got just a lot of procrastination up until October. During October, they started asking questions, what did I mean by prompt, and what did I mean by productive? Now, the facts of life are that they tried two offensive in May and August, and they got very severe setbacks. The facts are that they've had 35, 40,000 leave the country refit. The facts are that they're not doing it all well, but uh, they can continue to supply what they need for a very long time. But in October, we started getting these nibbles. What did the president mean? What? Uh, did he, he said that he had to have prompt and productive and uh, not take advantage. We said that we would consider uh, productive. The GVN had to be present. They said they were just generals and stooges and satellites, and Johnson put them in office, and that they would never sit down with those traitors. We said, you've got to sit down with them before we can ever work out the future. We can't settle the future of... Uh, uh, South Vietnam without them being present. We're not going to pull a Hitler-Chamberlain deal. Yeah. They said, well, they'd never do it. So on October the 7th or 11th, I've forgotten, they said, well, now what else is that all the president wants? If we would sit down with the GVN, what would he do? Now, they made no commitment. They didn't indicate they'd accept it. They just asked the question. But in you know, in trading, when a fellow said, how much would you take for that horse? Why, you kind of think that means something. So we followed it up and said, no, uh, we don't want to limit ourselves. We, the GVN's got to be present, and uh, we've got to have uh, uh, productive discussions, and we think they could be productive if they were present. But uh, we can't have a Pam and John and say, well, we'll do that, but we'll meet a year from now. It's got to be a prompt meeting, a week, two weeks, three weeks, something like that. So they said, well, if we could work everything out, we could meet the next day. So we came back to them and said that if uh, you will let the GVN come in and we'll meet the next day, we would like to take that up with our government. And they said, well, what else do you want? Is that all? You're right off that. And Harriman said, no. Uh, these are facts of life, and we know you're not going to sell out and, and uh, engage in reciprocity and that you're not going to accept conditions. Your pride and your uh, Asiatic face will not let you do that. You've got to save face. We understand that. 
but we could not sit at a conference table if you were shelling the cities. In other words, uh, uh, if I were talking to Dirksen in my living room and uh, my son was raping his wife, he'd have to get up and leave and quit trading and run and protect her. So we just could not sit there if you were shelling the cities. Nor could we sit there and have a productive discussion if you were abusing the DMZ. Yeah. So they said, well, that's reciprocity, and we're not going to pay attention to it. And they, about that time, uh, uh, Nixon made some little statement about uh, uh, we handled the war wrong, and then Hubert said that he was going to stop uh, bombing without any comma or semicolon, just period. And then Mac Bundy made a fool speech where he said we ought to stop it for nothing and pull our troops out. So they picked up and went to Hanoi. And they stayed in Hanoi two weeks from October the 15th to right about now. October 11th, I guess. They come back now, and all this time we have been working with everybody we knew. The governments cannot be named because it's life and death to them. They may be invaded. But uh, the Eastern Europeans have been helpful. The Indians have been helpful. The Soviets have been helpful. The French have been helpful. We've had them all in. And we have talked to uh, some of them nearly every day. And we've told them the clock was ticking and that uh, they could settle this in 30 days. They did in 1954 in 30 days but that our constitutional processes did not change. We would have a new president, but Mansfield and Dirksen would still be leaders, and Russell would still be chairman of the committee, and Fulbright would likely be chairman. And those men would carry on, and all of our joint chiefs would be the same, so they needn't to play. Even if Humphrey was elected, they're not going to get any better deal. Even if Nixon, they're not going to get any better deal. Now, this is for your information only. Yeah. We get to the point where it looks like that we might get the GVN in the meeting. And they understand thoroughly that they will bust up the meeting. We don't even come back here. Abrams is authorized with the rules of engagement to retaliate himself if they shoot across the DMZ yeah. by launching bombers immediately. And we've told them all that, told the Russians, told everybody else. <coughs> Now, if that gets in the paper, the deal's off. So that's why you cannot say this to anybody that's going to get in the paper. Because these folks are the most sensitive people in the world. But we have said this. And about that time, some of Mr. Nixon's people come in and tell both sides. Now, I have information about uh, who you had a glass of beer with last night. You don't know it, but I do. And you have ways and means. You have ways and means. Uh, you get my point, though, don't you? Yeah. You have ways and means of knowing what's going on in the country. What we know what Chu says when, when he talks out in Vietnam, and we know what happens here. And some of Mr. Nixon's people getting a little bit unbalanced and unfrightened, and uh, like Hubert did when he said no comma, no period, or like Bundy did. About the time you called me last week, they started going into the South Vietnamese embassy and also sending some word to Hanoi, which has prolonged this thing a good deal. Yeah. The net of it is despicable, and if it were made public, I think it would rock the nation. But the net of it was that uh, if they just uh, hold out a little bit longer, that uh, he's a lot more sympathetic and he can kind of, they can do better business with him than they can with their present president. And in Hanoi, they've been saying that, well, if you won't settle this thing, I'm not bound by all these things. So uh, I'm not, I haven't had this record and I can make a little better deal with you there. I rather doubt Nixon has done any of this. But there's no question but what folks for him are doing it. And very frankly, we are reading, uh, we're reading some of the things that are happening. So as a consequence, while Chu and uh, all of our allies are ready to go on a uh, bombing uh, uh, 
ceasefire cessation. It just may be temporary. We may be back on it in the next day if they don't follow these two things, if they violate the DMZ or if they sell the shit these cities. We could stop the killing out there. We could get everything we've asked for, the GV, in there. But they've got this question, this new formula put in there, namely, wait on Nixon. And they're killing four, five hundred every day, waiting on Nixon. Now, these folks, I doubt, are authorized to speak for Nixon, but they're going in there, and they range all the way from uh, very attractive women to old uh, line China lobbyist. And uh, some people pretty close to him in the business world. Uh, I was shocked when I looked at the reports, see. Eh? And I've got them, and uh, 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 so forth. Now, Chu has, that's had a little effect on Chu. He has signed on to this back as early as October that this is what we ought to do, as have all the Allied government, as have the French and as have the Russians and. Uh, the thing that busted up is that I know I had, and all of our people. Now, I told Dick Nixon and George Wallace and Hubert Humphrey that we had to have prompt and productive discussions. In order to be productive, the GVN had to be present. In order to be prompt, it ought to be in a matter of weeks, not two or three years. And that they wouldn't take advantage of, that meant that they just wouldn't be blowing up our house while we were trying to eat dinner. They wouldn't be hitting the DMZ in the cities. Now, if they do hit the DVM in the cities, we would have to just come back to bombing the next day. Now then, the facts are that as of now, the monsoon has started up there, and bombing ain't worth a damn and not going to be for 90 days in the north. So we, without telling them, we might quit anyway if we had nothing in return because we need to do it in Laos where it's drying up and where they can really increase their traffic. And we need to do it in South Vietnam where they are trying to mount an offensive on Saigon. So I called in all the Joint Chiefs and all of them recommended that we stop and that we take this GVN presence. <coughs> I called in General Momar, who has been in charge of Air Force, because I knew I'd have this LeMay on my hand, and Momar has been in charge of it in Vietnam. He operates from Thailand. He's down at Langley. And he explained to me that it wouldn't do any good where I'm bombing now, and if I get anything out of it, I ought to do it and move it over to the other places. Now, we can't say we're going to move it over, because it'll look like that we're not giving them anything, and we are not sincere that we had given up bombing the north, but we're going to spread more bombs on the south. But he told me that that was it. Every civilian, every military man we have talked to, and Andy Goodpaster particularly, is very strong. But I decided that I had to talk to Abrams before I reached any conclusion. <coughs> he had sent me a cable and said he would do it without the cities and without uh, uh, the uh, DMC if they just let the GVN be present because, in effect, he's going to do it anyway. Yeah. And he said, psychologically, the GVN being present will really wreck the Viet Cong because it'll mean that their supporters, the Soviet and the Hanoi, have really recognized them or they wouldn't let them come in the meeting. Well... That's what our folks think. I don't know. We're going to let the NLF come in the meeting, so we're not recognizing them. But they think psychologically this will really do them up in the South. And Westmoreland and Abrams and Momar, I think they've had them whipped since September. Uh -huh. They think they're whipped. So Abrams came in at 2.30 yesterday morning, or day before yesterday morning, and he drove 24 hours straight time, and he stayed here till 4 o'clock. And he was just as strong as horseradish and said that this ought to be done. We took this, and I went back to Paris and asked Paris how many times they told them that they had to respect the cities and respect the DMZ, and they counted up, and they came back and told them 12 times. Now, they've never agreed to it because they will not agree to reciprocity. They, but they know that if they, if they uh, don't do it, that Abrams, they trigger Abrams' reaction, so it just 
on again, off again, just a matter of hours, the bombing will be resumed. Yeah. So then we went back to the Soviet and said, we don't want to deceive anybody. This is close to the election. It's a very delicate period. I have told Nixon and Wallace and Humphrey all the same thing that I'm telling you now. Nixon said, do you have to have all three of them? And I said, no, I really don't have to have any if I thought that I have said if they do nearly any little thing, I would stop the bombing, but I'd like to have uh, all three, and uh, I'm going to try to get all three. Well, in effect, that's what uh, we're likely to get. So I went back to the Russians and said, now, we don't want to be deceitful. And if we should stop the bombing, the meeting's got to be prompt. The DMZ's got to be respected. And the... Uh, the shelling the cities has got to stop. And we know you can't guarantee it, but we want you to be damn sure that you know it. Because the moment we stop, if you start any of this, you're going to get hit with interest and we're going to double the force. And Abrams is, doesn't even come to Washington. He can do it automatically. Now we, I, Lyndon Johnson, have grave doubts that they will stop shelling the cities or the DMZ because if they do, they just admit they've lost South Vietnam. So I went to Mr. Kosygin and he came back and he said, uh, <coughs> the doubts the president has are unjustified. That he thinks they want peace. So then we went to the Indians and the Indians came back about the same thing. Now, that's where we are. We are now talking to uh, our folks here and talking about the rules of engagement and what Abrams would do if we stopped the bombing and if they should hit Saigon. And we're trying to conclude that, and we're going to uh, try to have Vance go back and talk to them again and be sure that they don't misunderstand any of the language, be sure they're willing to let the GVM come in the room of course, a communist agreement ain't worth a dime. They might walk out. But you're going to have to sometime test it. And Clifford says, and Buzz Wheeler said, you've got to test their faith. They may not mean it. But uh, that's about where it is. Now, uh, no decision has been reached. No order has been issued. It takes about 12 hours from the time uh, we make a decision until we issue the order. Uh, the meeting, uh, no meeting, could take place before the election. The meeting would have to take place after the election. But uh, it's my feeling that I ought to, the first minute I can, stop the killing if I can. I'm not can't justify saying that I quit the race for the presidency to get peace and put peace before politics. And then let some son of a bitch like Rafferty out here in Los Angeles say, well, Johnson's playing politics. Or I thought Dick's statement was ugly the other day, that he had been told that I was a thief and a son of a bitch and so forth, but he knew my mother and she really wasn't a bitch. I mean, you set up a statement like that and then deny it, it's not very good because he knows better. And that hurt my feelings. You damn Republicans get mean when you get in politics, and I think it's cost him a lot of votes. I think he's losing the last few days because of that statement. I played it clean. I've talked to Eisenhower about it. I made Wheeler brief him. I've told Nixon every bit as much, if not more, than Humphrey knows. I've given Humphrey not one thing. And up to now, Nixon and... The Republicans have supported me just as well as the Democrats and a hell of a lot better than McCarthy and Fulbright and the rest of them. But he got into politics and when he, this goddamn male laird, he told him the other day that Joe Califano and them were shoving me. Well, now, Joe Califano can't spell Vietnam. He's never been in one meeting with me. But that's what he put out. Now, the men that I rely on are Buzz Wheeler, General Westmoreland, Admiral Mora, General McConnell, the Chief Staff, General, uh, the uh, head of the Marine Corps, uh, General Momar, who's down at Langley, been in charge of air, uh, General Abrams, Ambassador Bunker, and Dean Rush. I don't pay much attention to any, even the subordinates over in the other place. Now, I've been at this five years, and if I don't want to sell my country out, I'd have sold it out five months ago and gone on and run for president and got this war behind us. And, been overwhelmingly elected, but I am a conscientious, earnest fellow trying to do a job. 
and I'm going to do it. And if I can get peace at 4 o'clock this afternoon, I'm damn sure going to get it come hell or high water, and we'll be under the guy that says you ought to keep on killing. Uh, but I, I, I really think it's a little dirty pool for Dick's people to be messing with the South Vietnamese ambassador and carrying messages around to both of them. And I don't think the people would approve of it if it were known. Yeah. So that's why I'm afraid to talk. Now, when I make a decision, and we are meeting again this afternoon, and we met all morning this morning, and we're out there, and it's 5.30 in Saigon now, and we're waiting probably till 6.30, 6 o'clock, to see what answers they'll give. We had to wait until Abrams got back home. He left, and he had to fly 24 hours, so he got in there at 3 o'clock, uh, straight through. <coughs> when we do... The first thing I'm going to do is call you if it's a, um, five minutes from now or five hours or five days, and I never know. I've thought a hundred times in the last month it'd be in five hours. But nobody knows when you're dealing with eight countries, with all the folks in Paris, with all the folks in Sa Saigon and here. But I'm going to call you and Mike Mansfield on the phone. I'm going to tell you exactly what I've told you now. I can't add a damn thing to it. Yeah. That if we stop the bombing, they are going to agree the GVM will come to the conference table promptly and productively. And we'll stay stopped if they don't hit the cities and if they don't go across the DMZ. If they do, we'll be right back at it. And Abrams got his orders when he was here the other day. Now, we'll just test their faith. I don't see that it'll make any difference in the political campaign because, first of all, the conference won't happen until it's over with. Uh, I think I'd be glad to say that all the candidates have uh, cooperated with me and we ought to have one voice in foreign affairs. And while they've criticized my conduct of the war, they have never told the enemy that uh, he'd get a better deal. But this last few days, Dick is just uh, getting a little bit shaky and he's pissing on the fire a little. Now, you, you ought to guide them just a little bit because uh, they're not running against me. I'm not going to be here. You're going to be my senator, and uh, uh, you're going to represent me and do whatever I want done. I'm going to be down at Purton Alley. But he oughtn't to he ought to go back to that old uh, kill tactic, see? Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, we have a transcript where... One of his partners says he's going to play this one just like Fortis. He's going to take the Republicans and the Southerners, and he's going to frustrate the president by telling South Vietnamese that just wait a few more days, and uh, he's not connected this war. He can make an, a better peace for them. And by telling Hanoi that he uh, didn't run this war and didn't get them into it, and he can be a lot more considerate of them than I can because I'm pretty inflexible. I've called them sons of bitches. Now, that doesn't give me, that's not very easy for me to work under those conditions. Any more than it is when Hubert says that he has stopped the bombing without a comma, semicolon, but period. Yeah. Now, they neither one of them got a damn thing to do with it between now and January the 20th. Yeah. And I'm going to stop it the earliest second I can. And I can stop it for nothing if I want to. I have five times before. But I'm not going to stop it unless they agree that the GVN will be at that table. Yeah. I'm not going to stop it unless they understand that if they want that table blown up, all they got to do is hit the DMZ or the cities. Yeah. And if I do that, it's complete, absolute, 100% all we've asked for since last September. Uh -huh. Now, I'd be glad to have any suggestions or judgments or advice that you've got to give. That GVN, you mean the government? <laughs> that means <laughs> these satellites, these stooges, these puppets that they've been referring to that they'd never go in a room with, that the people elected president and vice president, yeah. Chu and Key. Yeah. <laughs> That's been the thing and held it up. You can't divide up a country and settle it. If you won't let their president come, unless you're Hitler and Sudetenland and Chamberlain and stuff like that. Yeah. So basically, we have said they've got to have self-determination. And if you're going to make a decision that affects them, whether it's a 52 Geneva Accords, 
wherever you put the boundary line, they got to be present. They said, shut up, we will never let them come in the room. Now they've started asking, if we would let them come in the room, what else would you make us do? Now that indicates to us that uh, we can do it, and Vance is talking to them about it right today. Yeah. So that's it. Yeah, now what do you think about it? Well, I certainly don't quarrel with the way you handle this matter. And of course I recognize also that the fellows on our side get antsy pantsy about it. They wonder what the impact would be if a ceasefire or an halt in the bombing could be proclaimed at any given hour what its impact would be on the result next Tuesday. Well, I don't know what it'd be. I don't know. Uh, uh, first, there's not going to be any ceasefire. Yeah. Second, if there's going to be anything, which we have to decide, and we're trying this very minute, it would be just stopping the bombing, as we've done six or eight times. But yeah. the big question would be, is what did they stop? If they stopped the cities, and if they stopped uh, the DMZ, then there'd be a lot of hard negotiations that would last several months. Yeah. It wouldn't stop the war at all, but it might stop the killing temporarily. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it's been cut out in just a hundred the last two weeks. Uh -huh. And to me, with Nixon saying, I want the war stopped, that I'm supporting Johnson, that I want him to get peace if he can, that uh, I'm not going to pull a rug out of him. I don't see how in the hell it could be helped unless he goes to parting under the cover and getting his hand under somebody's dress. Yeah. And he better keep Mrs. Uh, Chenault and all this crowd uh, just tied up for a few days because he's got the right, he's got the right uh, formula, and I think he's done well. I think that I think it Humphrey screwed himself up. John Connor tell me he's going to lose Texas just because he shimmed it on the war. Uh -huh. Well, that, that's it. I'll have to separate this out a little. Uh, because he'll call again. Well, just don't put it in the paper and tell him that the first people, there are going to be two calls I make, and you have to be prepared to get them any time. Yeah. One of them is going to be the U.N. Mansfield and the leaders. Yeah. The other is going to be the candidates. Yeah. Both of you are going to be told the same identical thing. Yeah. And I, the damn man that says that he thinks the war ought to go on under these conditions will continue to bomb when they say that they'll let the GVN come and when we tell them that if they bomb the cities we'll be resuming it in one hour uh, I don't think anybody can justify that so I think that everybody ought to have a statement ready and ought to say well they have apparently given the president what he asked for and this doesn't mean we got peace at all this just means that we're stopping the bombing and they're going to agree to let us have prompt, productive discussions, which we've been raising hell about since September. So I compliment General Abram, Justin Westmoreland, for bringing them to this state of military affairs where they've got to agree to it. Yeah. And I've supported it all along, and I thank God my conscience I haven't ever pulled a rug out from under my commander-in-chief. Now, that's the way I treat Eisenhower, and that's the way you've treated me up to now. And don't you get so damn eager for 83% votes that you go cut me out there in the last few days. Uh, even though I, would. I know you wouldn't do it. I know you wouldn't. But the dick, I don't quite understand his people. Yeah. I don't know whether he knows it or not. But the, the other day he came out here and said, now, now, they say Johnson is a thief. But I knew his daddy, and I don't think he's a thief. And they say he's a son of a bitch, and I knew his mother, she's not a bitch. Well, hell, he advertised all over the country, and he left it, and he planted the idea, and he knew goddamn well I'd been fair to him. Yeah. And I didn't like that, and I found out Mel Laird was the one that uh, operated on it, your friend Mel Laird. Yeah, I haven't seen him around anywhere. How's your campaign coming? Well, it's coming on pretty fair. Well, now, would you do this any differently than the way no, I've been I trying would. to do it? No, I wouldn't. I could have settled this thing and stopped the bombing a month ago, yeah. but I've been trying to get all of my three things. Yeah. You understand, you understand, don't you, that they are not agreeing that they will stop shelling the cities. Yeah. You understand that they are not agreeing that they will respect the DMZ. Yeah. But they do know, if they don't do either, that we're not stopping the bombing either, so we're right where we started. Yeah. But they are agreeing, if we ever pull off the deal, 
that the GVN can come in the meeting, and that's what Russ says is absolutely imperative. Yeah. And that would be the government, the constituted government. The elected government of Vietnam, that all of these men went out there to, you appointed some men to go out from your outfit, and uh, I think Rusko went, I've forgotten. Yeah. And they watched the election, when Chu was elected and Key was elected. Yeah. And uh, uh, I hope you think this is all right. Well, I do. Thank you. Okay.